Hello and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me, Niall Murphy. It's the 25th of June, 2024, and it's nice and green. The grass is green again, as well as, you know, as well as the trees being green, because it's been raining a lot. We had a bit the rainy season's kind of come back and it's greened up the ground. And it's nice because I'm here in a place that's nice and lush and green. It's got that same sort of greenliness um, that you would find in England in May, which I'm really happy about. Finally, at last, we get a bit of moisture and um, I'm happy about that. I'm always at my happiest when I'm in the greenest places. Don't matter whether it's the green of the temperate north like Europe or whether I'm in the equatorial green. As long as I'm somewhere green, I'm all right. I wouldn't be happy if I was living in Antarctica, Greenland or Saudi Arabia to the same degree as this because uh, I'd either be in a desert or be surrounded by ice. So, you know, this is my habitat. Right, enough of the weather and all that bollocks. What I'd like to talk about today is Farage derangement syndrome, right? The trouble is um, there are some people out there that are highly divisive. And when they're highly divisive, there's, um, you know, there's two things I wish to avoid when it comes to stuff like that. I don't want to become a hater of Nigel Farage because um, I used to think I did, but now I realise that um, I, don't, I don't hate him because uh, the reason why I thought I hated him when I think about it was because I think, feel like I was programmed to hate him. This, I think, goes a lot to my backstory and the people I used to hang out with and what I thought used to think I believed. And um, then I kind of did a bit of a 180 on that. And um, now I find myself in this situation where um, I think that, well, I don't want to be anyone's fanboy. I don't want to be a sycophant towards anyone. I want to be able to stand back, look and think, well, you know, what reason do I have to hate someone? Do I have a reason to hate them? If I don't, then I won't. And I'm not going to decide I'm going to be a Farage hater just to conform to other people's reality models because then I wouldn't be being honest to myself. I'd just be lying. Lying to myself, lying to you, and all the rest of it. So I'm going to tell you um, why I don't hate Nigel Farage. Right? Um, back in the day, um, from his backstory, he... Uh, decided sometime when he was a young yuppie because that's what he was in the stock market uh, trying to make some money he decided one day that um, when he heard that Britain was going to join the European exchange rate mechanism that this would be economically quite bad for the UK and as a you know businessman or entrepreneur at the time he felt he was on uh, you know he had uh, the authority if you like in his mind to uh, to come to the conclusion that was um, quite bad so he sacrificed what he had pretty much he gave up that he could have just carried on making money doing what he was doing but he decided to give it all up to become a political campaigner against the european union and um you know i think you might not agree with that um but uh i, I think that takes a bit of conviction i think that takes a bit of integrity especially if you're going to give up you know, you find yourself on a money-making gravy train and you just throw it all in and think, no, I'm going to devote my entire time to fighting this. It's not easy, so fair enough. I've decided that's what you want to do. And over the years, when I think about it, I have my reservations about the European Union as an entity. And um, I kind of realised that um, as time had gone by, little things chipping away at the sovereignty of Britain, like, for instance, I know... Uh, you know, we don't always think of Tesco as the good guy. We kind of think of them as a corporate leviathan that's eating away and homogenizing um, Britain with its um, dystopian giant mega stores and all of that. But nevertheless, uh, Tesco did revolt against the European Union once. I don't know if people remember this, but um, the, the European Union brought in a rule that saying that Britain could not measure its um, fruit and veg in pounds and ounces anymore, um, or they would have to be fined. And I thought that's a bit of an imposition on the UK because we'd use the imperial measuring system. We still use miles um, when you're driving in Britain, incidentally. It's funny that. But if you're weighing fruit and veg, then all of a sudden you have to advertise it in kilos or grams first and pounds and ounces in small secondarily. And um, Tesco actually, um, well, you know, to be fair to them, they actually did uh, decide, right, we're going to ignore this. And then as a result of that, they were fined and they got in trouble and they ended up having to capitulate. And um, it was just simple things, little things like that, 
where a bunch of bureaucrats suddenly decide that you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that, and none of these rules come from the UK. And I think I remember some conservative politician who was talking about how, you know, in the last 10 years or something, that Brussels had brought in rules, the equivalent of the UK uh, had brought in over the previous half a millennium, you know, <laughs> things like that. And I just thought, well, so the, the Europe is basically uh, bureaucratically strangled by a bunch of bureaucrats who are overpaid and the state of, uh, you know, I mean, the European Parliament, the European Commission, uh, all of that, it's just, most of them seem to be a bunch of, um, you know, politicians who uh, haven't done very well for themselves, well, you know, who didn't do very well in their own countries, weren't the best politicians in their own countries. And then they were sort of, I don't know what you call it, demoted upwards, I think that's what they call it, you know. Uh, so as a result, they ended up on a gravy train in the European Parliament. And, um, you know, so I was developing a few Eurosceptic views because one of the things that I considered, you know, about the European Union is the fact that as Britain was the second largest economy after Germany and was a bigger economy than France and bigger than the economy than Italy, um, it didn't have much representation in, in Europe. Um, because, I know, the cultural chauvinism, I suppose, might be one uh, reason why. And I kind of feel that, like, with the political system that goes on there, do, do, we, does, do we really need to be centralised into a bureaucratic block that slows everything down, stifles everything? You know, the, the British establishment, I kind of think, is bad enough as it is. The civil service is bad enough as it is. The bureaucratic quagmire that exists in Britain is bad enough as it is. Do we really need to be centralised into an even bigger leviathan, you know? And I ended up coming to the conclusion that the European Union is like a car, well, it's like a car with 28 steering wheels, all right, 27 now, all right? That's why I ended up coming to the conclusion, right? And you've got, uh, say for instance, out of that, you've got Britain, Ireland, Malta and Cyprus, right? So there was, there was 20, 24 of these people wanted to drive on the right. Four of them want to drive on the left. So as a result of that, the car is, well, is it about 15, 20% over the line, right? As a result of that, none of them can decide where they want to go. And as a result, the car ends up upside down in a ditch. That's the conclusion I'd come to about the European Union. And um, yeah, there would be a few inconveniences. There would be a few sacrifices, but I kind of thought that like for me, I'd, I'm not just stopping at Britain wanting to be out of the European Union. I'd like to see the European Union over, personally, especially as a uh, Ursula von der Leyen, who um, re always refers to Klaus Schwab as dear Klaus, and then she re and then he refers to her dear Ursula back. You know, I mean they're that pally and they're that close. They're not elected. Political failure in their own country has that much power. You know, no, I don't like the idea of the European Union. And I don't think any country in Europe should have to suffer that. Also, at the same time, you know, I kind of think that as Europe um, does go more to the right um, with its own democratic processes, for good or for ill, I don't know. I'd imagine that some of these people are centre right, but some of them might be a little bit further to the right. I know that compared to the UK, the UK has never had a really bad far right problem. Whatever anyone says, it never ever has had, right? And I don't think it will in the future. And Nigel Farage is definitely not that type of person, whatever anyone thinks, right? But other countries in Europe do have a bit more of that. Now, of course, I also know, if I want to keep myself centred and unbiased as much as possible, I also know that if you've got a far left problem, as Europe is going further and further to the left, and, uh, and you know, the Overton window is so bad now that you're having people telling you that you're a Nazi and that you're far right for being slightly right of Chairman Mao and Stalin and all of that. So, you know, if you, you know, I, I probably am now, you know, they probably can't tell the difference between me and a bother boot wearing skinhead with a facial tattoo. That's the trouble. How the hell did that happen? But I also know as well as that, that if you are trying to set up a counterpoise to that and have a centre right party, like what, you know, like Nigel Farage did with um, UKIP and uh, with the Brexit party that eventually has become Reform UK, you are going to attract a few loonies and you are going to attract a few people that are too far to the right and you have to vet them and you have to get rid of them if they're too much like that because it's not good. Y you know, we're in a time of extremes and during a time of extremes you're going to get extremes. So you have to make sure you're not getting the right people, or the wrong people I mean. And, um, you know, as a result, he's gone out of his way. I mean, I've, for the last, 
God knows how long since he's been in politics, um, Nigel Farage has, to be fair to him, gone out of his way to get rid of a lot of the loonies, the people who are too much onto the right. He can't be seen even at the moment to be siding with Tommy Robinson. Now, again, I, I find Tommy Robinson isn't one of these people who I don't um, you know, consider to be anywhere near as bad as people are making him out to be. But at the same time, Nigel Farage can't, um, is trying to play it safe by not being seen to be allied with him because he wants, uh, you know, because it's an image problem. But then he went on, uh, was it Pan Panorama um, the other day, or was there another interview that he was on, where they accused him of being a, a Putin apologist, a Putin appeaser, for saying that years and years ago, he said this and now he's saying the same thing, that, you know, if you keep poking the Russian bear, the Russian bear's gonna respond. And I think this, to be honest, I think this myself, I think, that it was, you know, back in the day, I think it was a Secretary of State, James Baker, who was um, there when Bush Senior, I believe, was the uh, president, and they met up with Gorbachev. And they said that they were not gonna move NATO, not one inch to the east, was the quote. Now, I don't know, it probably wasn't a treaty. It probably wasn't like written in stone or anything, but it was a, a sort of a gentleman's agreement. It was a, it was a promise. We're not gonna go one inch to the east. And, um, all right, countries wanted to join NATO, countries wanted to join the, the European Union, um, but uh, I'd even heard that Russia wanted to join. I think when Tucker Carlson interviewed Putin, didn't he say that they asked to join, but they were turned down? So Russia was basically isolated and left in the cold while everyone else was invited to join NATO. And then uh, it just went further and further and further to the east after that gentleman's agreement saying, no, we're not going to go one inch to the east. And... Um, so I would say that um, the, the, the West ha has basically provoked this to some degree or other. Now, yet we know Putin is pretty much a gangster. He ain't a saint. You know, there's been a few um, people in the UK that have been killed with, uh, was it radioactive tablets and nerve agents and stuff like that. So, you know, he ain't, he ain't really the nicest bloke in the world. But um, this is the thing, this is, uh, you know, what we uh, are dealing with. But the problem is, of course, is that, like, the West has been guilty of um, interventionist politics, like um, bringing its war to enforce democracy on the Middle East. <laughs> As a result, you know, millions have died because of it. Um, and then in the post-Warsaw um, Pact, post-Cold War era, um, NATO, which is just nothing other than a remnant of the Cold War, and should have been stopped, replaced, reformed a long time ago, is still like one side of an obsolete paradigm. And um, because America is a gerontocracy and there's a lot of uh, old people from, you know, out to say are still living in that time, the 60s, 70s and 80s, you know, and haven't really updated their own software, we could have been living in a world where we could have cooperated with Russia. Yes, Russia is a bit more of a gangster country. Yes, they're more into power politics than they are into the rule of law. But then at the same time, the Western liberal order, what right does the Western liberal order have to say, well, look at us, we're white and white, we're squeaky clean, you want to go our way, we want to go everywhere, and we want to impose and expand our liberal order all over the place, when there's other people and other countries out there who don't agree. And... Um, I think it was uh, Carl Benjamin who said that if Mexico, which borders on the United States, said we want to join the Russian Federation, that America would not be too pleased about that. Right? Likewise, um, if uh, we were to try to think of it from the perspective of, of the Russians, you know, um, if uh, NATO is spreading eastward and the European Union is spreading eastward and these organisations appear to be expansionist, even if it's not that way from our perspective, but it is that way from their perspective, um, then we got to ask, well, what would have happened if the Warsaw Pact carried on after the Cold War? What would have happened then? You know, maybe the Soviet Union fell, maybe um, a few countries wanted to have a democracy and become like westernised countries, but what if the Warsaw Pact decided that it was going to carry on? And what if it decided that it was going to attempt to divide Germany up again and get the eastern half to join the Warsaw Pact you know, and then it was going to try and see if we could get a few other countries to join it as well. And, um, you know, and the NATO and the Warsaw Pact carried on um, a, having a, an, a Cold War in the absence of the Soviet Union's existence, in the absence of communist regimes. 
could you imagine if these two treaty organisations were still fighting each other afterwards? The Warsaw Pact did pack up in the end, but so should NATO have done, that's what I think. Something new should have formed. You know, an international body, including everyone, like including Russia, uh, all of Europe, or well, pretty much uh, as many countries in the world for whom this would concern, should have sat down and, and come up with an idea for a new organisation. And it wouldn't have led us to the place that we are now. And now as a result, we're embroiled in this war, Cold War too. And, you know, we've got these belligerent, hawkish, bloody warmongering politicians who are bloody obsessed with Russia um, in the UK. And all Nigel Farage has done is come out and say that, you know, we shouldn't have poked the bear in the first place the way we did. Um, had we not have done, we wouldn't be in the situation that we are now. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. I don't necessarily agree with everything Nigel says, right? Um, there's a few things I think he's all right on, and as a person, I think I'd, I'd love to meet him in a pub. I'd actually like to talk to him. I'd never get him on this show. But hey, I reckon, I reckon banging the world to rights with him would be a great laugh, to be honest. Um, I can't say the same thing about Keir Starmer or Rishi Sunak. You know, that's the thing. He does seem to be a lot more human than a lot of the other people that are around at the moment. He's a very charismatic, maverick politician. And uh, he, to me, uh, fits all the criteria for some great reformer who's going to come along and change things. Probably, you know, mostly for the best, maybe for the worst in some cases. He ain't going to be perfect because politics never is. But the fact is that we're in this sort of time now where the only thing to do is just carry on business as usual. Right. And um, because uh, Nigel Farage is off script, there is an organised attack on him that's very similar to the organised attack on Donald Trump by saying that the only reason why he won in America was because of Russia. You know, they always do that, don't they? This is the same playbook over and over again. And I'm at that point now where I'm just thinking I'm so sick to death of being taken for a see you next Tuesday by these people who underestimate my IQ by 25 points. I'm so sick to death of these gatekeepers of this obsolete, stupid narrative in the mainstream who really, you know, are the most contemptible weasels of people. I mean, the Conservatives, how can you take them seriously now when, I mean, the, 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 they were doing some insider betting. They were betting on the election after finding out when it was likely to be and put 100 quid in William Hill. Why didn't they put more money down on it? Stupid idiots, you know? Um, at least, um, you know, if they're going to completely fuck up their entire career, why didn't they just, um, you know, sell the family silver, sell everything, sell all their assets, bring it up William Hill and um, do that instead? Then they could retire on their profits, but no, that is just really, really stupid. They all are stupid. And then on the other hand, you've got the Labour Party, Keir Starmer and all that lot. And my God, you know, what the hell are they going to do to Britain? I just think that, like, you know, I don't want to go back there. The idea of going back there with that just makes me, makes me sick to my stomach. It really fucking makes me sick to my stomach, the idea that we're going to have those loomies and those... Oh, my God, no. But I'll tell you one thing, if um, Nigel Farage and Reform did win and they were actually going to act out their policies and, and actually keep some of their promises, they don't keep them all. A lot of the time they don't keep any of them. But I kind of think that um, I am now of the opinion that Nigel Farage would actually create a Britain that would be worth revisiting. But I don't see that with uh, Sunak at all or the Conservatives. I certainly don't see that with Keir Starmer at all. And, you know, I kind of think that he's a cometh the hour, cometh the man type of person. He's right for this era. He's, he, you know, he's, he's right to make a comeback at a time like this. Whether or not he's an all-round good person or not, I don't know. I don't think. Maybe, you know, he has been politically expedient um, a few times in ways that have not really been 100% honest. I'll, I'll grant you that. Um, you know, if you were working for him, I'd imagine that he'd be quite ruthless. So I can imagine that he's, um, you know, he's got feet of clay just like everyone else. But, you know, as I say, I'm not going to become a fanboy of any one individual. I just look in the bigger picture, I look and I see now, if someone is, you know, being, uh, attempt if they're attempting to character assassinate someone, if there's an organised smear campaign on someone by the entire mainstream media at a time like this, and it looks like there are dirty tricks going on, and it's all aimed at that one person who challenges the status quo, that person who's challenging the status quo, 
must definitely be worth considering, you know? That's how I look at it. Now, of course, you know, on one hand, you're going to have all the people who are programmed to hate Farage because they th still think he's a fascist. On the other hand, you're going to have all the conspiranoid people out there that are going to say to me that, um, you know, the whole thing's theatre, the whole thing's an illusion. It's all a conspiracy right down to the nth degree. And the fact that you're even falling for this must mean you're the sheeple now. They're going to say this because, look, we are in a, in a time of echo chambers. We are in a time of extremes. The internet has done this to us. It's very hard to keep your own mind at the moment. Right? And that's the problem. And as I say, I'm not here to promote any one person. I'm not here to be anyone's sycophant. I'm not here to be anyone's number one fan because I don't think that's what it's about. But at the same time, my attitude is, if there's an organized attack on one person who's a maverick, by the mainstream and uh, by everyone else and, and there's all these people who are like acting like NPCs who are just getting swept along with it like sheep who don't appear to have minds of their own then that one person who is the maverick must be worth considering, he must be worth acknowledging because maybe he's doing something right maybe not but maybe he is and that is the way I look at the world whoever they want to smear, whoever they don't want you to like it's definitely worth a look because they obviously feel threatened. Um, they've obviously got a status quo they want to keep up. Well, that status quo that they're keeping up has not done us any good, has it? You know? Um, they're, they're attempting to bring in a dystopia. And I don't want to go into the specifics of the dystopia that they're going to bring in, but you know as well as I do, whether it's demographic change, whether it's the taking away of freedom of speech, whether it's globalism, whether it's um, you know, uh, the, the, you know, the impoverishment of us all, whatever, you know the score. We know which uh, direction they're trying to take us in and um, it would be great if someone was able to come along and stop that and reverse that to some degree or other. But we shall see how it turns out. Now, again, I would ask people out there, you know, you can like or dislike whoever you want. I'm trying to be in an ideological liminal space while I look at this. I know as being a human being, it's not always easy to do that. But I do think that, you know, how can I say, I do think this needs to be discussed. It does need to be spoken about. So, yeah, I'll be interested in your comments down below. I shall leave it at that now. See you later, alligator. See you soon, baboon. If you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And while you're at it, check out all our social media links. Please help this channel grow. Your help will be appreciated.